All right, take out those notes that you got on your way in today. I am fired up to bring God's word. Brand new series that I'm starting today. We'll go over the next five weeks called Friend of God. I'm gonna talk to you over this series about developing a divine connection with God that is the, what I see throughout the scripture as the greatest level that's available for us as Christians. And I just wanna start this whole series off by just saying there's more of God for you to experience than you've experienced so far. Doesn't matter if you're 20 or 85, there's more of God for you to experience. So I wanna take you into this deep level of God. I've extensively studied the scriptures over those last couple of months, preparing for this series. And I'm telling you, I found a secret that I'm gonna give you. And every week we're gonna go deeper and deeper into it. I've titled today's message simply as the introduction to this series. I've titled it The Friend Zone. The friend zone. Now, if you know anything about the friend zone, you know it's not a zone you want to be in in a relationship. Because how many know when you're in that guy-girl relationship, when you're in the friend zone, it ain't a good zone. It reminds me of this guy. I'm telling you, I saw this post on social media. If this was you, I'm sorry. I stole it. But um, it says, this girl posted this. It says, oh, from go- top golf to dinner, flowers, ice cream, and horseback riding, you outdid yourself on this Friend date. Oh, how many know that's tough right there, Daniel? Poor Daniel. You don't want to be Daniel in this story. Just want you to know. And it says, you set a standard for how I should be treated. And you set such a high one. I thank God. Then you bring in God into the equation. I thank God so much that he put amazing friend like you in my life. Thank you for making me feel like a true princess. Hashtag still single though. Come on, just jab. Just turn the knife right there. Poor Daniel will never recover from that post right there. In a relationship, you don't want to be in the friend zone, but I want to present to you in this series, the greatest level you can experience in your walk with God is a friendship with God. It's a friendship with God. Here's what a friendship with God is. It's an active relationship, you write down your notes, an active relationship that involves depth and trust. You ever meet those people and you come in contact with them and you're going, they're just different. I know I'm a Christian and they're a Christian, but something's different. There's a level of depth. There's a level of trust. There's a level, it seems that God answers their prayers more than he answers mine. You ever meet those people and you're like, what is it? Here's what it is. They have friendship with God. Actually, I've divided all, all people that would call themselves Christians into three categories. And here's the three relationships. The first one is a fan. Those are people that admire God from a distance. And I would say a vast majority of people that call themselves Christians are actually fans. They're, they're going, yeah, I'm there Easter, I'm there Christmas, but I'm not really letting it affect my life. That's a fan. The next one is a follower. A follower is someone that walks in obedience. They sit there and go, you know what? I, I know what it means to lay down my life. I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm gonna get baptized. I'm going all in on this thing. And I would say those who are most of the people that are born again, they're, they're followers. That's where your life has actually gotten changed. Then there's a third category. I've never taught on this third category before in my life. Because I've always taught, like, your greatest goal, get to become a follower of God. But actually, there's a third level that's even deeper, and it's friendship with God. And a friend with God is someone that pursues depth and trust in their relationship with God. God connects with you in a deep way, and you connect with God in a deep way. And I want you to know, you can walk into friendship with God in this series. So we're going to look at it through the life of a guy in the Old Testament. Now, I want you to see this. There's hundreds of characters in the Old Testament that are heroes of faith. But out of all the heroes of faith, there's only two that God calls his friend. Now, some scholars would bring it up to four, but really there's two that God says, that person is my friend. Now, you know how there's some people that have like 80 best friends? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, you thought like you were their only one, and then they call everybody else their best friend, and this is my best friend, and this is my best friend. And some of y'all think that's like God. God's like, we're all his best friends. That's not true. That's not true. You could be going to heaven. That doesn't make you a friend of God. I want to bring about a friendship with God uh, availability for your life, because hear me out, hear me out. You're going to need it in these times to come, because our world is getting crazier. And they don't need half-hearted, barely in it followers. They need people that can be friends with God, that know what God's thinking, that know what's on God's agenda, and can execute that agenda in the world today because they're in friendship with God. Are y'all with me today, church? So we're going to look at it through one of the two Old Testament friends with God. We'll do the second one next week. It's a guy by the name of Abraham. 
Now, if you are um, been around faith for a while, you know Abraham as the father of faith. If you grew up in church, you know Abraham as Father Abraham had many sons. Come on, if you know it, sing it with me. And many sons had other Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are. Yeah, 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 y'all ready? So let's all praise the Lord. Right, okay, we're done, we're done, we're done, we got it. All right, so that, that's Abraham. Now Abraham, let me cover you the idea of who Abraham was. Abraham was not some great king or great pastor or some great priest. Abraham was simply a guy who was actually in this area of, of the ancient Near East called Mesopotamia in this big city and God called him out of this big city really into obscurity. It would look just like any other person. We, we think of these heroes of the faith like if they were living in Tampa, they would be like the Tampa celebrity. That's, that's not Abraham. Abraham wouldn't have been the Tampa celebrity. He would have been like the, the, the plant city farmer, okay? Just want you to know. So, so, so not the big wig, not the big dog, but he was somebody that was called a friend of God. Let me show it to you, Isaiah 41. It says it like this, but you, Israel, and my servant, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of, and here's what he calls us, and he all calls us all this, so we're all descendants of Abraham. He says Abraham, but then he puts his tag on Abraham's name. That's so shocking. Abraham, my what? Oh, you gotta help me at all of our campuses. My what? My friend, my friend. He actually calls Abraham his friend. Let me show you an example of this that's mind-blowing to me. So Abraham, one time in a story, we see that Abraham called, God calls him, and his nephew Lot goes lives in a city called Sodom. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were known for their sin. So God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. You might have heard the story. Abraham goes to God because he's a friend of God. I'm going to show you how this is possible with your life. Goes to God and starts negotiating for Sodom's for Sodom's um, saving of the city. He goes, God, you won't destroy that place if there's 50 people, 50 righteous. God says, well, Abraham, all right, I won't do it for 50. And then like every good Jewish businessman out there, he says, you know what? I'm gonna talk him down a little bit more. And he brings him from 50 to 40. And then he brings him from 40 to 30. And then down to, he, down to 20. I mean, this guy's the original like salesman here. And Abraham brings God down all the way to 10. All the way to 10. God, you won't destroy it for 10? God said, okay, I won't destroy it for 10. Imagine having that kind of relationship with God. You can negotiate with God back and forth on what the plan is for the world today. That, that's, it's mind-blowing, but it's possible with your life. Now, Sodom ended up getting destroyed because there wasn't even 10 righteous people there. But the, 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 the principle is still the case that you can have a friendship with God that sets you apart from the rest of the world. When you're a friend of God, his concern becomes yours and your concerns become his. Don't you want that in your life? Don't you want it where you go, man, I pray and it just seems like, man, God just shows up. Why? Because you're a friend of God. And, and I want you to understand this about God and his friendship with you. God is a reliable friend. Reliable friends are very rare in our world today. People are, are in and out. People are, are, are loyal whenever it's only good for them. But I want you to know that's not our God. Our God is not an inconsistent, fair weather, whenever it's good for him, friend. He is a consistent friend with you at all times. The Bible actually says one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. And by the way, that's why a lot of your life keeps getting messed up because you have unreliable people around you. So what do you do when you have unreliable people around you? There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I've come to remind you today that when people might be unreliable, our God is not unreliable. When people might fail you, God doesn't fail you. Come on, we can give God better praise than that. It's the fact. So Abraham is a man who is a friend of God. Let's see how it plays out in his life. So we see about it in the book of James. So James is a New Testament passage, which by the way, Abraham has talked about more. Um, Abraham is the number one most talked about Old Testament character in the New Testament. There's 60 references of Abraham in the New Testament. Shows us how impactful his life was, which by the way, Abraham's life is not something you look at just to in, be inspired by but for you to imitate. Because if God could use Abraham, he could use your life. If Abraham can be a friend of God, you can be a friend of God. So the Bible tells us an insight on why Abraham was a friend of God. Let's look at it, James chapter two, and then we're gonna dissect this. This is gonna be a little Bible study-ish today, but I, I'm telling you, it's gonna, it's gonna be great for you. James chapter two, verse 23, it says it like this. 
And the scripture was fulfilled that Abraham believed God. What did he do? He believed God. He believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. So his righteousness came from his belief in God. And he was called what? God's friend. He was called God's friend. So we see that the whole thing started in Abraham's life when he believed God. Here's what that means to you. That friendship with God is impossible without first having faith in God. It all starts with faith in God. And we see in Abraham's life that his life was a life marked by faith. Radiant, can I encourage you? Be a person that's marked by faith. In the small things and in the big things, your life should be marked by going, I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe God. We see it in the very intro of Abraham's story. Abraham's story is that he's in this area of Mesopotamia. It's a place that's filled with idolatry. Very few people in that area would have known the creator God, but Abraham knew God. And we see the start of a story in Genesis chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, would you flip over there? Because we're going to talk a little bit about this, this idea of what happened with him. Genesis chapter 12. And then look what happens in this story. Verse 1. And it says like this. And the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, to your father's house. So to the land I will show you. Now, I don't know about you. That bothers me about God. Because God did not tell them, go here at this time. At this place, you're going to meet this person. That's not how God works. Have you noticed that God does not give you details? Does it frustrate anybody else that our God doesn't give us details? Like, it frustrates me. But what I've learned about our God is he doesn't give us details. That's because if with, that, with the details, it wouldn't require faith. <laughs> but we live a life by faith. So he tells them, hey, I want you to pack up and I want you to leave. And Abraham, look what the, verse, the next verse says. God, I'll, I'll leave when you tell me what's going to happen in the future. Is that what he says? It's not what he says. He says, so Abraham went. I want to be that person. I want to be that person that when God tells me to go, I go. When he tells me to give, I give. When he tells me to speak, I speak. I don't ask details. I just happen to be obedient to God. And he went. And he went. And, and Lot was with him. And Abraham was 75 years old. Can I just look right at the camera? I know, I know there's a lot of people on the other side of that camera across our locations across Tampa Bay. And let me just say it this way. You are not too old to live a life of faith. I think we think of this idea of the, the moments of faith should be for those that are 18 or 28 or 38, but I'm believing God's raising up a generation that some of the most faith-filled moments of your life are at 58 and 68 and 78 and 88. God's not done with your life yet. That we are called to stay in this moment of being, live, being led by faith, making faith steps, making faith decisions. And this is what I love about God because God is friends with people who live by faith. And I wanna be God's friend. So my life has gotta be marked by faith, even if it doesn't make sense. You see, we are called to live by faith. You are called to live a life that is a life of faith, meaning you might not know the details, but you still obey God. You might not have enough, but you still give. You might not know how it's all gonna work out, but you still step out. Because why? Because we don't live by sight, we live by faith. And God honors people who live by faith. We see it all throughout the scriptures. So what did Abraham do that made him a friend of God? We know that he started in faith. Look what it says in verse 23 of James 2. Let's go back to James. He says, and the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God. So when did he believe God? Did he believe God because he moved? Well, we know that's true. Did he believe God that he would have a son? Well, we know that's true. But the Bible actually tells us exactly what it was that made Abraham God's friend. All right, now, I have studied Abraham's life for years. I've never seen this before. Verse 23 is where our, our anchor verse, but we miss it if we don't go back two verses. Look at verse 21. It tells us the story, the moment, where Abraham became a real friend of God. You ready for it? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous, remember this is how he believed in faith, for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. So this is a different story in Abraham's life. He moved in faith. He had a child in faith. But now he has offered that child on an altar. So this story is probably one of the most misinterpreted stories in all the Bible. 
Because people look at it and go, God is crazy, God is weird, it doesn't make sense. I'm gonna break it down to you in the few minutes I got with you to show you how it was Abraham's offering of Isaac on the altar was what really connected him with friendship with God. And it, says, it goes on in verse 22 of James 2, it says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. So it wasn't just that he believed God, but he worked together with action and it was made complete. I don't know about you, I don't want half-hearted faith. I don't want barely faith. I don't want just enough faith. I want filled up faith. I want complete faith. I want full belief in God. Like that's what I'm going for in my life. All right, so, so let's look at our verse. All right, we're gonna turn together to Genesis chapter 22. If the story of Abraham and Isaac is the story where Abraham really walked into full friendship with God, then let's break it down. And, and I could preach a whole series off of this. I'm just gonna give you five points in a few minutes, and it's gonna help you. Ready? Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, okay, let me pause there for just a second. What does that mean? So Abraham's 75 years old when he goes and he moves. God tells him he's gonna have a child. Now, I don't know what you wanna do at 75. <laughs> I ain't have no kids at 75, come on. People come up to me, I'm 40 now, and they're like, hey, you want more kids? I'm like, no way. I don't even wanna be around your kids. Like, I'm a, no, I'm just I don't, that's not true, but. Um, Abraham's great desire in his heart that God would give him a child. And so God promises at, at, at 75. Well, let me just tell it to you this way. It doesn't happen at 75. It happens when Abraham turns 100. So let me just, just look right at the camera and tell some people. What God wants to do in your life and what he's promised in your life might take longer than you want it to take. It's going to happen, but it's going to take longer than you want it to take because God's timing is perfect. So 25 years of pain and waiting on the Lord. And then at 100 years old, God gives it to him. Now, I don't want a kid at 100 years old, but that's what Abraham wanted. And God gives him the, the child Isaac. And Isaac is the line that would, Jesus would come out of that we would now find salvation out of. So this is a promised child. So now we see in Genesis 22, sometime later, this is about 20 plus years after Isaac's born. So Abraham's about 125 years old. Y'all still following me? And then Abra Isaac is about 20 plus years old. Y'all with me? All right. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now I want to pause there for just a second. And I want you to understand this. This is a crucial, crucial verse. Okay. God tested Abraham. Have you ever wondered why God tests you? Why does God put us through test? You see, many times we look at the test that we're in as the same way that our teacher tested us in school to figure out if we know the information. God's not testing you for that purpose. God is not testing you to figure out if you have faith. He's God, he knows all things. He's not testing you to know if you have faith. He's testing you to build the faith that you do have. You see, his testing is actually his training so that he can strengthen you to be stronger and to grow in faith so that you can walk into the purposes that he has for you next. So if you're in a season of testing, don't get frustrated with God. He's not angry with you. He's trying to prepare you for the purpose and the destiny that he has in your life. Come on, somebody. That's the right reason God tests us. And by the way, the greater the test in your life, usually the greater testimony that's on the other side. Some of y'all be got to get encouraged by that. All right, so Abraham tested, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am. He replied, then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Say Moriah. Moriah. You're going to need to know that in a few minutes. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. I will show you. Let me give you five things real quick on what a friend of God has. Number one, a friend of God knows the voice of God. Notice it with a story today. God's speaking to him and he's not sitting there going, I don't know, is that me? Is that, me? Is that God? I don't know. What well, God, are you wanting me? No, he knew his voice because friends of God know the voice of God. Probably one of the greatest questions I get often is how do you know if God is speaking to you? And I know many of you have debated that. You're like, was it, was it me? Was it God? Was it the food? Was it Taco Bell I ate last night? What is, what is it? And, and I want you to know this, is that the only way I can explain it is it's the same way that when I'm in a crowded playground and my kids are playing, if my kid starts crying, I know it's my kid immediately. I don't even have to see them to know it's them. Like when your kid starts crying, I, don't, I tune it out. I don't even care. 
Come on, let's be honest. You're on the playground. It's not your kid. You're like somebody else's problem. But as soon as it's my kid, I know it. Why? Because I know my kid's voice. It's something about I've been in their presence enough. I've been around them enough. I have history with them. It's the same with God. When you're in God's presence, when you gather and worship with God's people, when you're reading God's word, you learn his habits, you learn his character, you learn his voice, and you're able to go, I just don't know. I can't articulate it, but I know that's God and that's not. I can just know. And the Bible says that Jesus said it this way, my sheep listen to my voice. You always need to be listening. God, what are you speaking to me about? As a friend of God, I'm listening all the time. God, what are you saying? What are you speaking about? What are you leading me for? I know what's going on. I know what the news says. I know what the government says. But I, know, I want to know, God, what are you saying in my, my situation right now? That's what friends of God do. By the way, God tells him to sacrifice his son. <laughs> this isn't the first time he heard the voice of God. Some of y'all are making decisions on major life things and you're going, I guess God told me to do this. And I'm going, have you been faithful with the small directives God's given you every single day? Like before you go for the big things, be faithful with the small things. Like open up his word and go, okay, God, if you're challenging me on that small thing, I'm gonna be faithful with it and I'm gonna learn your voice so that I can eventually be responsible with the big things you wanna give me in my life. Does that make sense today, church? So Abraham hears God's voice and God tells him to do something that doesn't make sense. Sacrifice your son, but he obeys. And the Bible goes on to tell us, so Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. Now, I find this interesting because Abraham did not carry the wood, the fire and the knife up the mountain. I think it's for two reasons. Number one, he was 125 years old and he didn't want to. Come on, after a certain age, you go, all right, I'm no longer carrying this stuff, all right? But I think there's actually another reason. I think there's another reason because Abraham knew this principle of what a friend of God does. Friends of God, write it down in your notes, they let their faith influence people. There, there's no world in, with a friend of God where they go, ah, this is my private faith. No, there's no, no it's no private faith. It said, well, this is just me and God's thing. No, 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 no. I'm a friend of God, and as a friend of God, I'm going to let that faith influence the world around me. So I'm going to let it influence them. You ever been around a Bama fan? <laughs> they're not secretive in their love for that cult. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? Like, it's just, they're all in. They're all in. Like, they'll, they'll influence you. They'll tell you. They'll go all in. I'm Let me tell you why. Just, it's just, it's just they're, they're all, they're, it's no secret. You ever been around someone that's taking up pickleball? I mean, it is bizarre. You get around them, they're like, hey, can I tell you about pickleball? Can I tell you about the kitchen? Can I tell you about what happens? Can I tell you about my new paddle? I'm like, nobody asked you about any of this. But we have no problem pushing that on other people. Yet for some reason, it's taboo in our world today to say, I'm a person of faith and I want my faith to influence the world around me. Can I just say, we're raising up a group of people at Radiant Church that'll say, my faith isn't meant to stay private. It's meant to impact the world. It's gonna impact my family. It's gonna impact my neighborhood. It's gonna impact my business. That's what faith is called to do. And Abraham said, listen, if I'm on a faith journey, Isaac, you're on one too. We need some parents to be raised up to say, hey kids, if I'm going to church, you're going to church too. If I'm gonna read the word, you're gonna read it with me. Well, I don't like it. We're gonna read it together. Because we're gonna, we're gonna let this faith impact their life. I could preach right there. Come on, somebody, I don't have time. I could go into it. We got a tropical storm to avoid. Let's keep going. <laughs> Verse seven. So Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> Great question. You ever had that moment where your kid asks you a question that's like above their age appropriateness? And you're like, you know, where did, where did kids come from? Where did, where did babies come from? You're like, another time, we'll talk about this. That was, Isaac, that was Abraham's moment. He's like, oh, about that sacrifice. Look what Abraham responded, verse eight. By the way, people reuse this passage to say, you know, God's cruel, God's demented, God's weird. Let me just tell you, there's a reason this passage is in there that's actually so beautiful about the character of God. You just gotta dig a little bit deeper because this, this verse right here answers it all for me. Verse eight, 
Ready? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Can I just present this to you today? This is a theological opinion, but I'm pretty positive about it. God never would have had Abraham kill his son. Wouldn't that be against the nature of God for him to have a person kill another? I mean, he just, he, he, like, do not murder. That's like one of his things. So why would he do this? He was already, he was setting this whole thing up for a greater story for us to be a part of. This whole thing was, was part of it. And Abraham, here's my opinion. I think Abraham knew from the very beginning, God wasn't going to have me kill this child. God no, wouldn't do that. Because what did he say? Put the verse back up one more time, please. He said like this, God himself will provide. Notice he didn't say God has provided it. Because then I would have been like, so it's you, Isaac. <laughs> God knew that wherever I'm going, I mean, Abraham knew wherever I'm going, I'm gonna, God's going to provide for us there. He's never going to make us do something that's against his character and his nature. That's why, number three, ready, is that friends of God know the character of God. They know God's character. So it's, so it's, they're not sitting there questioning, going, well, I don't know. I don't know if, I, I've seen this all the time with people when they go, life is bad and things happen and they're going, well, I just don't know. I don't know what God's doing. I don't know where God's at. Let me remind you, God's character is trustworthy. He is a trustworthy God. When life is bad, God is, has a character that you can hold on to, that he's faithful and he's good. And, 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 and if you go by your own feelings, you'll think God's distant or lazy or disconnected. And that's not our God. When we study, when we learn the character of God we, by studying the word of God, and when we go into the word of God, we look at it and we see that his character is good that he is merciful, that he is long-suffering, that he's not wanting any to perish. I don't know about you. When I read the scriptures, I'm, bringing, I'm getting lots of hope that our God has good character that we can trust in. He's faithful to us. He's with us at all times. Come on, give him better praise than that. He's a good God, church. I, I get encouraged. Our, care, our God's character is good, and Abraham knew that. Why? Because friends of God know the character of God. You go, Aaron, I just don't know God. I don't know him. That's why you need to be part of a radiant group because the character of God is best known in the community of God. And if you don't know about our radiant groups, they, they have some that are happening right now. You can jump into most of them will launch in September, but we need you to lead some groups. We need people to lead good Bible studies, good things that will go through the scriptures, good things that will help people learn God's voice. Why? Because it is in community we learn the character of God so that we can best be friends of God. Y'all with me? So my challenge for hundreds of y'all today is going into this fall, lead a group. You go, Aaron, I'm not trained. I'm not qualified. Welcome to all of our lives. None of us are. But we'll train you. We'll help you walk through the process. And so that you can do this, because we need a church that is biblically literate about the character of God. Amen. He's a good God. Our world is so confused about who God is, Amen. but his word is not. And we can hold on to it. All right, we're, we're almost done with this. Let's, let's finish, finish this up. So Abraham and Isaac are on the mountain. Y'all still with me in the story? Yes. All right, they're on the, on the mountain. Abraham builds the altar. His son's standing there places Isaac on the altar, and he lifts up the knife. Now, I want you to think of this tense moment. He's got the knife in his hand. His son's there. He's like, okay, God told me to do it. I'm going to do it. Doesn't make sense. I know God's going to do something. And then in this moment, as the knife is going down, verse 12 happens. And I love verse 12. God speaks and says, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now, by the way, in that moment, aren't you glad you heard the voice of God? <laughs> oh, God, are you speaking? Are you not? All right, just go ahead. No, you, in crucial moments, you need to know God's voice. And, and it says it like this. It says, do not do anything to him. And then look at this next verse. Now I know that you fear God. Wow. I know that you fear God. And that you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Number four, I don't have time to talk about this one today, but I'm going to do a whole message on it in a couple weeks. Because friends of God walk in the fear of God. I've actually learned that the fear of the Lord is the secret sauce to friendship with God. Because if you're walking around going, hey man, me and God, me and Jesus, we're homeboys. You've missed it. Jesus ain't your homeboy. He's your Lord. He, he's in charge. But you can have friendship with your Lord and Savior, with the creator of the world. But you got to make sure you know your place and you know his place. 
Uh, Psalm 25 says it this way. I love this. It says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. What a verse. I love that. Like, I want friendship with the Lord. How do we get it? We fear the Lord. And, and if you don't know what that is, you need to come back in a couple of weeks because I'm going to talk to you about what it means to walk in reverent submission to God. It's not being afraid of God like we're afraid of spiders or death or whatever. No, it's to have a holy reverence and awe of who he is. The fear of the Lord. All right, let's keep going. and We're almost done. So the story ends. Look how it ends. So, so God says, don't, don't kill him. And then verse 13, Abraham looked up there in the thicket. He saw a ram caught by its horns. So he went over and he took the ram and he wrestled it and the ram punched him and then he punched the ram back. None of that's in there. But can you imagine? I always just think him and the ram are just fighting, you know, like some like cartoon. All right, all right, let's have fun with that. All right. He took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Oh, now, now it's come together. Now we get to see why this whole story happened. And by the way, when you're in your seasons of testing, you don't know it, but there's always a greater purpose on the other side of it. Now we see the greater purpose of Abraham's great test, where it showed his friendship with God, but it actually was a sign, a beautiful picture, a beautiful moment to actually bring in what we can all experience now. And he says, so Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. That's a title of God called Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. And I've come to declare it over somebody's life today that he is still our provider. No matter what you need, if you need healing, he's our healer. If you need financial blessing, he is our provider in that. If you need salvation, he's still our savior. I'm telling you, God's still our provider. And it says it like this, and he says, and on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, this, this, this shocked me. Okay, first of all, write down the fifth one, and then I want to put that verse right back out there. Number five, God, friends of God's experience his provision. They experience his provision. They, they experience it. So no matter what you need, you experience that, that provision with him. Because you just have trust knowing, you know what, if God's brought me to a scenario, there's going to be a ram in the thicket. And I'm telling you, I've lived, I've, I've lived long enough and I've done this long enough to know that that ram in the thicket still shows up at the last minute. God still provides financially. God still provides healing. God still provides peace. God still provides relationally. I don't know what you need, but it's found in him. Can I hear a good amen today, church? Look at that verse. Can we put that verse up one more time? It says, and Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And then it says, and on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The Lord provided, and then the Lord will provide. I didn't understand that. I'm like, which one is it? He will provide, or it will be provided. Which one is it? So on this story, we see he's Jehovah Jireh. He provided for Abraham. But then you gotta do a little bit of Bible study, okay? So I was so pumped when I saw this. Okay, so where Abraham sacrificed did the sacrifice on the mountain. It's called Mount Moriah. Remember I showed you at the very beginning. So it looks something like this, okay? So this is, this is some hills in Israel where, where Abraham would have walked up that hill at 125 years old with his son to do the sacrifice. And on that mountain, somewhere in that area, the ram was in the thicket that was the provision of God so that the sacrifice would be made. Well then, hundreds of years later, David, who by the way was the second person, oh, another person called a friend of God. David would show up to that very area, but now it wouldn't be called Mount Moriah. That area was transformed into a place called Jerusalem, the city of David, the area of David, where David would eventually build what's called the temple right on that mountain. And the temple would have the place of the Holy of Holies where the sacrifice would be made for the provision for people's sin. Does that make sense? Same mountain the Lord provided for the people. But it didn't stop there with that temple because hundreds of years later, then the fullness of that temple, the fullness of that mountain was completed because in that same area, Jesus came and was betrayed, rejected, and beaten. And yet again, he, as an Isaac, walked up that mountain with his own wood, with his own cross, 
And then on that same hill, that cross would be planted as a sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. It was on that mountain that God said, I'm not done providing for you. I'll now provide your freedom and your salvation and your eternity in heaven. Come on, Radiant Church. Is there anybody that's thankful that our God provides all that we need? Come on, church. He's still our provider. And it was on the mountain that God provided the salvation you need. All right, all right, all right, I'm done. I promise you, I promise you. Romans 5, one last verse, ready? Our friendship with God was restored. How? By the death of his son while we were still his enemies. Even though, for we certainly be saved through the life of his son. And then look at the verse 11. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus has made us friends of God. Can anybody give God a little bit of praise for the fact that Jesus provided it for us? Let's pray. What is God speaking to your life about today? Oh man, maybe you've strayed a bit in that relationship with God. Maybe you've kind of let off the, the gas and that pursuit after God. Maybe, maybe once you had great friendship with God and you've kind of just drifted, this is your moment to go back. Just, just have a moment to pray and say, God, search my heart. Lord, I repent. I want to I want to have that moment. I want to be that Abraham. I want to be that friend of God. Lord, stir up in all of us today a holy hunger for more of you, God. Jesus, do it in us. I want more than anything, God, to be your friend. Lord, you've paid the way because of what you did on the cross. We thank you that we can go from enemies of God fan, to follower, to eventually friends with God. We want to be that person created in this house. Lord, as we go on this journey together this next month, let us be stirred in a deeper way than we've ever been before to know you, God, in a deep way. Every eye closed, every head bowed while God's speaking to your heart. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with him, you're not a friend of God. You would say, Aaron, maybe I'm even a fan, but I'm definitely not a follower. I've never gone, surrendered my life to him. This is your moment. Jesus paid the price for your sin so that you can have that relationship with God and you can start it right now. If that's you on the count of three, I want you to respond in faith by throwing that hand up and say, Aaron, pray for me. Today's my day. I want to give Jesus my life. I've been praying for you. You've braved a tropical storm to get to church. Don't stop short of the decision that you need to make to totally surrender your life to Christ. This is your day. One, two, come on, be bold. If that's you, throw that hand out. Three, this is your day of salvation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, anybody else? Thank you, thank you at all of our campuses. 10 campuses across Tampa Bay, that's you. Come on, raise a hand, thank you. Thank you right here, thank you. Proud of you, thank you, thank you. So many hands all over this room, thank you. God saw that hand, he sees the posture of your heart. Why don't we all pray this prayer out loud together? If you raise your hand, don't just say it with your mouth, believe it with your heart. Come on, let's pray together. Say, dear Jesus, come on, say it loud. Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I give you my sin. Forgive me. Give me a fresh start for the rest of my life. I'm gonna follow you. Thank you for dying for me. I choose to live for you. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that believes it says, come on, Radiant Church, let's give it up for those who just made the best decision. Well, thank you so much for watching Radiant Church YouTube channel. Don't forget, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to this channel right now. You can click the button so you don't miss anything. You can support the ministry by sharing this message with a friend or by clicking the Give Now button that you see on your screen so that we can continue to see lives changed for Jesus. Thanks for watching. The best is yet to come.